Hi, I'm Niels Neumann. I'm a quantum scientist at CNO and today I'm going to tell you about multi-agent reinforcement learning using simulated quantum annealing. First I'm going to tell you quickly what TNO is and what TNO does and then we'll go into the deep and we'll look at the work we have done. TNO is the Netherlands Organization for Applied Scientific Research and we focus on a wide range of topics and we work together with and for uh, the government, for universities and for small, medium and large enterprises. Related to quantum technologies, we work on building a quantum computer, we work on applications for those quantum computers, and we work on applications of quantum networks, such as quantum key distribution. Finally, we also work on post-quantum cryptography protocols and applications uh, to be used as cryptographic protocols, presumably secure against quantum computers. This research that I, today I'm going to tell you about is inspired by AI applications that TNO works on for military applications. AI has a wide range of applications, whether it is object detection in videos or images such as airplanes, or it is finding the safest route or the, the shortest route in an unknown and possibly hostile environment. This last, this last application, the grid reversal application, is what we use the quantum analog for. With almost all AI applications, AI algorithms, it is the case that with more data, you will get better results. However, with more data, you will also need to train your network longer or um, uh, must do more computational steps which makes it much harder the more data you have to train your network. So we looked at quantum computing, at quantum annealing as a way to reduce this time, as a way to train your network in a faster way than you would be able to do using classical computers. So, the problem. Suppose you have a grid and we have a reward, in this case indicated by the R. You have a wall which can, for instance, be a building or, in some sense, an insurpassable uh, blockade. And we have a penalty indicated by the P. And that can, for instance, be a riot, uh, a, a, a pathway that you have little to no information about or it can be a location uh, known to be uh, um, to host terrorists or hostile people. And suppose we are located somewhere in the grid and we are given the task to obtain the reward. We have to traverse the grid to, uh, uh, to get to the location R. Well, we can use a reinforcement learning technique to do that, to train a model on what to do best and what the best steps are to take in this model. And it basically comes down to you are in a specific location, you take an action and you get feedback from that action, from the environment. For instance, it was a good action if you reach the reward or if you get closer to the reward or it was a bad action if you end up in the penalty state, in the P state. And using this feedback, we can tune our actions based on the specific location that you are in. And that way, find the optimal traversal policy, find the optimal way to traverse the grid to get to the reward um, as good as possible, as efficient as possible, as short as possible, or whatever your objective function was. And we can even introduce some stochasticity. So, uh, for instance, uh, the penalty term only uh, gives a penalty in certain cases, or only gives a penalty with certain probability, or with certain probability you take the action 
that you intended to do and with some other probability you take another action. And if you train a model you will in the best case find this policy. This is the optimal policy given the grid we just, ha just had. And note that even if you start in the penalty state that does not mean that you cannot reach the reward. The penalty state is just there to indicate it is a bad place to be at. So the policy should learn that. The policy should learn to avoid the penalty state, as we can see also in the optimal learned policy. Well, as I said, learning this policy can be quite hard. So we try to use quantum approaches to, uh, to optimize this, to improve upon this. Well, what do we do? We define a neural network where each node uh, uh, where each position is assigned a node. So in this case, that would be 14 positions because the wall is not a position that you can attain. And each action is also given a position. In this case, that would be four actions up, down, left and right. Where we can possibly also introduce a fifth action, which is to remain uh, steady, to, to take no action. Well, this gives us this neural network and you see that we also have some hidden nodes, the hidden layers. And those are nodes that we do know nothing about. And we are free to choose the layout of these intermediate nodes. And the task is uh, to find weights, weights W, between the two nodes, between all two nodes, um, to uh, uh, in order to give your best policy, in order to learn the best policy. And the best policy is associated with optimal weight. And the, the way to then use this network is to, for instance, uh, fill in the location. So suppose I'm in location S3 and using the optimal weight, then a high probability will be obtained for action, say, A2. So, you know, in state 3, I have to take action A2. Well, this neural network can be translated to a cubo formulation, to a quadratic and constrained binary optimization formulation. And this formulation is what we can use on the D-Wave machine, on the quantum annealer that we run it uh, that we have run this algorithm on. Now what you see is you see uh, cross terms, so WXI, w, uh, um, WXI, XJ, and we see single qubit terms, single node terms, the WXI. And what is important to notice is that the WXI can be set to zero because the uh, the preference of a node has no impact on the eventual result. It is the purely the links between all the nodes that will uh, determine the optimal policy. And how do we learn these nodes? We learn these nodes by fixing a training sample SI, fixing a location SI, and for every action A, I, we uh, sample the network and we sample the network using the D-Wave hardware backend or using simulated annealing. And this way we get back the, uh, we can determine the objective value for this state action combination. And using the objective values we can then update the weights such that the uh, the optimal ways are to be found, are found. Okay. If we have this model, then we can extend it to uh, a different number of agents. The, the, in the model that we have just seen is a model that is to be used for a single agent and a single agent has to obtain a single reward. We can also define a similar model for an arbitrary number of agents. 
and an arbitrary of number of agents that has to cooperate to find a different number of rewards simultaneously. So for instance, two agents that simultaneously have to obtain two different rewards. Well, how do we do that? We take again a neural network, we take independent states for the different agents. So for each agent we have a node for all possible states and we take tuples of all possible actions. So we get actions A1 for agent 1, A1 for agent 2, A1 for agent 1, A2 for agent 2 and so on. And then we again sample the neural network similar to what we did for the single agent environments. Well, here we see an example of a multi-agent uh, grid that we considered. It's a 3x3 three three grid. We have a wall in the middle and we have two rewards uh, located at the upper left and at the lower right corner. And the goal for the agents in the grid is to find the two rewards simultaneously. And if they do, we get a reward. If they don't, they do not get a reward. Well, we have uh, simulated these uh, environments using simulated quantum annealing. We run these environments using simulated quantum annealing on the D-Wave device, so on the quantum hardware. And for comparison, we also run a classical deep reinforcement learning algorithm, so a similar algorithm on a classical device. And we compare the results to see how good each of the approaches are. There are some hyperparameters that we have to define, for instance, the grid layout, the number of samples that you take, and the connectivity between the qubits. We determine these hyperparameters with a grid search for a single uh, environment, for one environment, and we use those hyperparameters for all the other environments as well. Well, the first environment that we consider is a 5 by 7 environment with three walls and a single penalty. This, is, this can be seen as an extension of the initial environment that we saw earlier in the presentation. And we see that the simulated quantum annealing using simulated annealing performs quite well. It quickly goes to a fidelity of 0.9. The simulated quantum annealing run on the D-Wave hardware um, is seen to have a lower fidelity, but it is likely due to noise and due to uh, mapping constraints that have an impact on the fidelity of all the qubits and of the end result. The black line indicates the deep reinforcement learning results, and we see that at 500 training iterations, the fidelity is still around 0.4 compared to the 0.55 for the D-Wave results and the 0.9 for the simulated annealing results. If we run the classical deep reinforcement learning for more iterations, then we do see that still the fidelity of 0.9 is reached with the classical approach. However, this takes approximately 5,000 training iterations to reach the same fidelity as we obtain with simulated quantum annealing after only 250 training iterations. We also run a deep, um, um, the same approach for the multi-agent for the multi-agent environment. So two agents, two rewards, and we have a wall in the middle and we have to find the optimal policy. This grid is much more complex than the single agent uh, environment because there are dependencies between the agents that also have to be learned. Therefore, we see that the results for simulated annealing, simulated quantum annealing, and for the deep reinforcement learning are much lower than we saw with the single agent learning uh, for the grid above. 
And in this case, the simulated quantum annealing reaches a fidelity around 0.4, just as the deep reinforcement learning does. However, using the simulated quantum annealing, we approach this fidelity much faster after 250 training iterations instead of the 2000 training iterations for the classical result. And we see if we train the classical algorithm for even longer that the same fidelity of around 0.4 is obtained. So the fidelity is not getting any higher. We do not have the results for the simulated quantum annealing run on the D-Wave device because the uh, time needed to train the algorithm was too high for a uh, 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 good enough estimate. So we only show the simulated quantum annealing results using simulated annealing. Okay, these were the results. Some final remarks. We saw that using the quantum approach, using the quantum annealing approach, we learn the optimal weights much faster than using the deep reinforcement learning classical approach. However, we also saw that the classical approach reaches similar performance levels as the quantum approach. And this is to be expected because the classical approach and the quantum approach are in the same, have the same complexity. The quantum approach um, offers a speed up, but it's a constant speed up. And that is what we saw in the previous plots. So using the quantum approach, you do learn much and much faster, but the classical approach, given enough training iterations, will attain similar fidelities. In our analysis, we do not keep, uh, we do not incorporate communication overhead. Um, we, mer we just communicate it on the number of training iterations that is required. Because in our case, the communication overhead to the remote machine was far greater than the computation times and therefore do not give a fair comparison, do not allow for a fair comparison. And this approach is therefore is interesting to speed up intractable machine learning problems, to speed up machine learning problems that are too complex or that take too long for classical devices to be run on. Because even a constant speed up factor can still be the difference between being able to run an algorithm and not being able to solve it. And thus, being the difference between using AI in practice and the problem is too big, too large, too complex for us to run, to use. So, thank you for your attention. Again, I'm Niels Neumann, I'm a scientist on quantum technology and the uh, paper that this presentation is based on can be found via this link. Thank you for your attention.